The soft tissues and joints of the elbow are located superficially and are optimal targets for ultrasound evaluation. The most commonly diagnosed soft tissue pathology is lateral epicondylitis, which is a misnomer. Microscopic evaluation of the tendons reveals no signs of inflammation but angiofibroblastic degeneration, collagen disarray, or tears. Besides its diagnostic applications, ultrasound plays a significant role in guiding interventional procedures in the elbow joint. Essential for successful ultrasound use in the elbow, as in other body parts, are understanding regional anatomy, careful physical examination, and proper technique and image interpretation. Join our master class membership today and unlock a treasure trove of knowledge. Benefit from updated weekly videos, including inspiring lectures, clinical case discussions, and image interpretation insights. Elevate your skills and connect with like-minded doctors. Subscribe now for a brighter professional future. Anatomy Surface anatomy, the lateral and medial epicandyles, palpable as discrete bony prominences on the distal humerus, serve as important landmarks for ultrasound examination of the elbow. On the posterior aspect, the triceps brachii runs longitudinally, inserting into the olecranon process. Elbow joint, this complex hinge pivot joint comprises three distinct articular components, the ulm humeral, radiocapitella, and proximal radioulna joints. The joint capsule and collateral ligaments provide joint stability. The synovial cavities of these three elbow joints communicate freely. The joint capsule is easily visualized posteriorly in elbow flexion within the olecranon fossa, a large hollow accommodating the olecranon process during extension, and in the coronoid fossa, a small hollow on the anterior aspect of the distal humerus. In cases of arthritis or joint effusion, these fossae show fluid distension and serve as targets for needle insertion. Ligaments The ulnar collateral ligament comprises anterior, posterior, and transverse bundles. The radial collateral ligament complex includes the radial collateral ligament, lateral ulnar collateral ligament, accessory collateral ligament, annular ligament. This complex fuses with the overlying common extensor tendon, making them indistinguishable histologically or ultrasonographically. When assessing tears, identifying whether the pathology is superficial or deep is critical to determine whether the injured tissue is tendon, ligament, or both. Subsequently, the type of tear or degeneration becomes a crucial prognostic factor in treating tennis elbow. Muscles and tendons. Anterior muscle compartment. The distal biceps tendon begins about 7 cm above the elbow joint, forming a flattened tendon that lies superficially and inserts on the radial tuberosity. Behind the biceps, the brachialis muscle covers the anterior joint capsule. Lateral muscle compartment, this group, which extends the wrist and hand and supinates the forearm, originates at the lateral epicondyle, where the extensor carpi radialis brevis tendon attaches anteriorly and the common extensor tendon posteriorly. These tendons, often implicated in tennis elbow, blend and cannot be discreetly separated. Medial muscle compartment, comprising flexor muscles like the flexor carpi radialis, flexor carpi ulnaris, palmaris longus, flexor digitorum superficialis, and pronator teres, this compartment's common flexor tendons attach at the medial epicondyle, though they are shorter than the lateral elbow's common extensor tendon. Posterior muscle compartment, this group includes the triceps and anconius muscles, with the triceps tendon attaching to the olecranon process of the ulna. Scanning technique. The patients may lie down on a table to evaluate the elbow joint. It is helpful to divide the examination into four parts, anterior, lateral, medial, and posterior. Once skilled, it is possible to tailor the examination to assess the patient's specific site of complaints or targeted clinical questions. Different positions of the elbow joints are needed for each examination target. Anterior Evaluation The patient is instructed to extend the elbow and supinate the forearm for the examination, which begins in the transverse plane with the transducer placed parallel to the elbow crease. The transducer is then moved proximally and distally. In the transverse images of the supracondylar region, 
both the superficial biceps and the deep brachialis muscles are visible. Medial to these muscles, the brachial artery and the median nerve are located, with the nerve positioned medially to the artery. For diagnosing arthritic effusion, locating the coronoid fossa and assessing the amount of fluid in the deep space is useful. The coronoid fossa appears as a concavity on the anterior surface of the humerus, typically filled with the anterior fat pad. Normally, a small amount of fluid may be observed between the fat pad and the humerus. The distal biceps tendon is evaluated in both transverse and longitudinal planes, but it presents a challenge due to its deep and oblique course towards the radial tuberosity. The examination usually starts more proximally at the musculotendinous junction, following the tendon distally, while the patient's forearm remains in maximal supination. This positioning helps bring the tendon's insertion at the radial tuberosity into view. Correct ultrasound transducer orientation is vital to avoid anisotropy, requiring the distal half of the probe to be gently pressed against the patient's skin. This maneuver ensures parallel alignment of the ultrasound beam with the distal biceps tendon, allowing adequate visualization of its fibrillar pattern. The long axis view is preferable for examining the distal biceps tendon. Short axis planes are less effective for assessing the distal portion due to the potential for dramatic variations in tendon echogenicity with slight changes in probe orientation, which can cause confusion between the tendon and the adjacent artery. Both the radial tuberosity and the bicipitoradial bursa should also be examined. Lateral Evaluation The lateral aspect of the elbow is examined with the elbow flexed and the forearm pronated. After evaluating the common extensor tendon on its long axis, the coronal planes are utilized by positioning the cranial edge of the probe on the lateral epicondyle. The attachment of the common extensor tendon typically presents a uniform, hyperechoic, triangular shape. It is important to assess the lateral epicondyle for any surface irregularities or signs of enthesopathy. Under normal conditions, the lateral collateral ligament complex cannot be distinguished from the overlying deep portion of the extensor tendon due to their similar fibrillar echotexture. It can only be estimated by the location of the structure. I will focus on the detailed structure of the lateral tendon and ligament complex in a different lecture. To evaluate the radial nerve, begin by locating the main trunk of the radial nerve in its short axis, positioned between the brachioradialis and the brachialis muscle. Trace the nerve down to where it bifurcates into the superficial sensory branch and the posterior interosseous nerve. Continue tracking these nerves in their short axis using meticulous scanning techniques. It is crucial to demonstrate the posterior interosseous nerve in short axis planes as it penetrates the supinator muscle, passing through the arcade of froze, located between the superficial and deep parts of the muscle. Medial Evaluation for the examination of the medial elbow, the patient is positioned supine with the shoulder slightly abducted and externally rotated and the forearm externally rotated. An extended elbow position is preferred while evaluating the common flexor tendon, but a 90 degrees flexion view is more suitable for assessing the medial collateral ligament. Dynamic scanning with valgus stress, demonstrating joint space widening, can benefit partial ligamentous tears where the ligament is intact but lacks. Using coronal planes and placing the cranial edge of the transducer over the medial epicondyle, the common flexor tendon is visualized on its long axis. This tendon is shorter and thicker compared to the common extensor tendon. The anterior bundle of the medial collateral ligament should be checked beneath this tendon. For the cubital tunnel evaluation, the patient is asked to rotate the forearm externally while keeping the shoulder fully abducted and externally rotated. The ulnar nerve is examined in its short axis from the distal arm through the distal forearm. It is important to carefully observe any changes in the nerve's dimensions as it passes through the epicondylar groove and the cubital tunnel. I will also have time to explain further of this structure. Posterior Evaluation the posterior elbow can be examined with the joint flexed at 90 degrees and the arm resting on the lateral chest wall in a lateral decubitus position. The olecranon fossa, triceps tendon, and olecranon process should be thoroughly evaluated using longitudinal and short axis planes. 
particular attention is needed for the most distal portion of the triceps tendon, right up to its insertion into the olecranon process. Beneath the triceps, both the olecranon fossa and the posterior olecranon recess are assessed. The olecranon fossa is a concave area in the distal humerus, typically occupied by the posterior hypoechoic fat pad. When evaluating the olecranon fossa and the superficial olecranon bursa, it's important to avoid applying excessive pressure with the transducer, as this may display small bursal effusions. Thank you for tuning in, and for your valued membership. I look forward to connecting with you in our upcoming videos. Wishing you a joyful 2024, and I eagerly anticipate seeing you on my YouTube channel. Until then, take care and stay well.